Welcome back to When Harry Met Board Games, where we feed our people with relatable content, and our victory condition is your satisfaction. I'm Harry, and today we have another top 10 list for you all. Today I'll be covering my top 10 Spiel des Jahres winners. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Spiel des Jahres, basically it translates into English as the game of the year, and this is the most coveted, prestigious award within the board game industry. This award has been around for about 40 years now, and the recipients of this award have been benefited by much success because every time you get that Spiel des Jahres logo, that Spiel des Jahres seal of approval onto your board game box cover, it automatically increases and spikes up sales. Now, I have not played every Spiel des Jahres winner as they're, like I mentioned, this award has been around for about 40 years, but I've played a good amount and based on my experience, these are the 10 best winners. So without any further ado, let's get straight to the list. My number 10 Spiel des Jahres winner is Catan. And I know lots of people are probably going to tune away, give this video a thumbs down, and move on to better things in their lives. But I had to put this game on this list. I did consider putting Celtis by Reiner Knizia onto this list because I do enjoy that game. And Catan is a game that I have grown cold on. I have not played this game in about two years. I have not played it on a regular basis in over five years. And I'm not sure if I'm ever going to play it again, although I do have a copy still in my collection because I do want to teach this to my son one day. So I guess I will play this again. But I had to include this here just because of nostalgia nostalgia and historical purposes. We are basically here, I am here doing this video because of games like Catan. Catan has had such a powerful influence on this industry, on this hobby, and to this day, so many people absolutely love this game. As a matter of fact, not too long ago, I had a People's Choice Top 100 Games where over 3,100 people participated in a survey. Check out that video, by the way. And so many people rank Catan as their favorite game or somewhere within their top five games games of all time. So this game is still beloved by many people in the hobby. But yeah, again, I had to include it. I am not as big of a fan of this game as the other nine games on this list, but it's done so much for me and for the hobby as a whole. So Catan is my number 10 Spiel des Jahres winner. My number nine Spiel des Jahres winner is King Domino by Bruno Cathala and Blue Orange Game. And this game is basically the quintessential Spiel des Jahres because the Spiel des Jahres has basically turned into a family-friendly, gateway, light kind of introduction into the board game hobby type of award. For the meteor or medium weight type of games, we now have the Kenneth Spiel Award. So this game is such a perfect gateway entry point into the board game hobby. It is light, it is super duper quick, and the presentation is phenomenal. It's a beautiful, gorgeous game with great uh, production and great uh, graphic design and color and artwork. And this game was included on a recent list, my top 10 gateway board games of all time. Uh, so it serves that purpose as well. And basically in this game, players are trying to build up their kingdom, which is represented by an imaginary 5x5 five five grid that you're trying to fill out with as many tiles as possible. And basically the tiles are uh, comprised of two parts. This is a domino and the two parts of the tile represent different terrain features. Sometimes you might have a tile that has two of the same terrain features, right? Kind of like in domino you might have a tile that has uh, the same amount of pips on both sides. So in this game you're trying to build contiguous sections of one terrain type and basically have as many crown symbols on those uh, or within that section as possible because at the end of the game you're going to multiply the crown symbols by the amount of terrain types of that same feature that are contiguous and in uh, adjacent to one another. And whoever has the most points wins the game. But it's a really cool, neat puzzle. It has a really cool mechanism for drafting the tiles and determining turn order for the uh, next round, the subsequent rounds. Really cool, really neat. It introduces some cool, neat mechanisms, but it's a very basic uh, game as far as gameplay is concerned. My number nine, Spiel des Jahres winner of all time, King Domino. And now we move on to my number eight, Spiel des Jahres winner, and that is Ticket to Ride. And I am still a big fan of this game. This game, unlike Catan, which I have grown cold on it, I still enjoy this game. I may not have it as highly ranked on my overall list as it once was, because obviously I've played 
hundreds and hundreds of games ever since I played this game, but I still enjoy it. I'm a big fan of geography. I love exploring the different uh, continents and countries of the world, and there's so much expansion content for this game, which breathes new life into it, because not only does each expansion introduce a new map, uh, a new uh, spatial element as far as connecting routes from city to city and things like that, but it also adds slightly new mechanisms, nothing radically drastic or or totally different or something that's going to blow your mind and still remains very much a gateway game, but they make the game fresh and trying to uh, figure out that new twist, that new wrinkle and trying to successfully uh, strategize accordingly. It's just a really fun process. And again, lots of content out there for it. I own every expansion that's still in print. And I would say I've played more than half of them. There's still about half of the maps that I haven't even played yet. But every map I play brings something new to the table, both literally and figuratively. And again, I just have a good time. And every time I introduce this to uh, non-gamers or casual gamers, it's met with much success and it's very well received. My number eight, Spiel des Jahres winner of all time, Ticket to Ride. My number seven, Spiel des Jahres winner of all time is Alhambra. And Alhambra here, designed by Dirk Hen and published by Queen Games, is basically a tile laying game where you are building your Alhambra, which consists of different types of buildings. And not all buildings are created equal in this game. Some buildings are more valuable than others. And basically you tell the building apart by their different artwork, but also their colors. And you are drafting these buildings, actually you're purchasing these buildings with these currency cards that you're drafting throughout the game. And basically the currencies come in four different colors, which correspond with four different markets on which you will find these different tiles placed. And in order to buy a tile from a particular market, you need to have currency cards in your hand that match that market's color and the numerical value, the sum of all the cards that you're spending needs to be equal to or higher than the value or the cost of the tile you're trying to purchase. What's interesting in this game is that every time you purchase a tile, you do not break uh, your currency or make change for it. You do not get anything back. So sometimes you have to overspend by quite a bit. However, the game does reward you if you're able to shrewdly manage your finances or get lucky enough to purchase a tile for the exact cost. Because typically on a player's turn, you actually only get one action. You could either draft currency cards or you can uh, purchase the different tiles from the market. However, if you are efficient enough or lucky enough, as I mentioned earlier, to purchase one of these tiles for its exact cost, then the game rewards you with a bonus action for that turn. You can even get as lucky enough as to purchase all four of the different tiles on the market for its exact cost and then get potentially five actions on a turn. That's very uh, rare and hard to do. I don't think I've ever experienced that, but I've seen a couple people pull off two or even three actions in a turn because of their efficient spending. So even though the tile lane is kind of like the heart of the game, I feel that the crux of the game is the purchasing or manipulating the currencies and purchasing things in the market. That's the most neatest and funnest aspect of the game as far as I'm concerned. But the tile lane is very intricate too because you do need to follow very specific and strict placement rules and you are rewarded for getting contiguous or consecutive uh, walls uh, lined up with one another that grants you bonus points at the end of each round as well and basically you're trying to have a majority in all of these different color buildings it's almost like a stock market game and the different tiles kind of represent your shares so really cool game my number seven Spiel des Jahres winner of all time Alhambra my number six Spiel des Jahres winner of all time is Tikal by Michael Kiesling and Wolfgang Kramer. And of all the games that I have on this list here today, this is by far the least successful. It's not even close. Some of the games on this list have sold millions upon millions of copies. I'm not sure how well this game has done. This game has even struggled over the years sometimes to remain in print, even though for the most part it does remain in print. But this game is, first of all, it's the first pairing of Kiesling and Cromer. This is something that's legendary now within the hobby because these guys have produced so many games and have collaborated on so many projects over the years. But here, Tikal, their first project is 
basically an area majority game that also has a little bit of tile placement. You're kind of exploring the forests of the Mayan jungle here. And as you explore the forest, uh, you place these tiles, which basically uh, represent explored land. And you could find temples that have been excavated. Or perhaps you can find uh, particular treasure tokens that you might want to uh, discover and find. And basically, as the game progresses, you're trying to gain these different treasure tokens which are kind of like a set collection in the game and you can turn them in for victory points on a scoring round and if you get two of a kind that's even more valuable if you get three of a kind even more so and also you're trying to go to these different temples you're trying to excavate these temples because the digger you the uh, deeper you dig the more uncovered that temple becomes and the more valuable it becomes which means it'll score more points for you at the end of a scoring round and the way you can claim these different temples and have the the rights to score for them is by having a simple area majority in those areas. If you can have more of your explorers in that um, space, then you have the majority and you will score the points. If you are tied with somebody else, then neither one of you will score the points, or I think you split the points. But again, very simple area majority, but the neat thing about this game is the action point allowance system, which was first introduced by Wolfgang Kramer and Michael Kiesling in this game, and they repeated this mechanism in many games for years to come. And basically, you have a certain pool of actions to choose from in this game. I believe there's six different things you could do. And each of these actions is worth a certain amount of action points. Not all of them are created equal. Some of them are as simple as just one action point. Some of them are so valuable that you must spend five action points in order to execute them. And basically on each turn, you have 10 action points to spend. You don't need to spend them all, but none of them carry over to the future either. So you want to be as efficient as possible. And you want to try to map out your turn and do as many of those actions. Again, you got that pool of six different actions to choose from. And you want to do as many of them as possible. But at the same time, you want to make sure the decisions you make are the right ones for that moment. And basically, the game has a bunch of different scoring rounds. You score about four or five times in the game. And you want to set yourself up because when a scoring round is triggered, you know exactly that it's coming. And you're able to execute your 10 action points and then score for them. Really cool game. Really Looks really, really nice. Even this old Rio Grande 2000 edition. If you get the revised or newer edition uh, from Super Meeple, I believe it is. That game looks gorgeous with three-dimensional uh, temples representing the temples on the board. Gorgeous game. Beautiful game. My number six. Spiel the Jars winner of all time. Tikal. And now we move on to the top five. The cream of the crop. And my number five. Spiel the Jars winner of all time is... Kingdom Builder, designed by Donald X. Vaccarino of Dominion fame. And this game, it's a little bit of a controversial game in the hobby. Lots of people uh, say good things about it, but there's probably even more people, at least people of note, people who are reviewers, who kind of knock this game and don't really see its value. But I think it is a great game. It's very much an abstracted game where basically you have... Uh, the, these lands comprise of different terrain types. You have desert lands and mountains and you have um, grass fields and forests and you have flower fields and you have uh, wheat fields. And basically you're just placing down your settlements and trying to score points based on a bunch of different things. This is a very modular game with lots of setup var variability. The game comes with uh, eight modular boards that you put four of them together to make the actual playing board for that game session and it also comes with a bunch of these kingdom cards and the kingdom cards are basically what determine the way you score and you always choose randomly three different kingdom cards for each game so every game is going to play differently not only from the setup but also from your objectives how you're trying to score because a strategy that worked in one game may not necessarily work in the other game because those moves mean nothing for you because they're not going to score you points so you're figuring out the three different kingdom cards, and based on that, you're trying to make your decisions and strategize accordingly. And basically, it could be anything from simple route network connecting, you know, connecting certain spots together with through the use of your settlements, or it could be an area majority, having the majority in a particular area, or just trying to have a big cluster of your settlements contiguous to one another in order to score tons of points for them. Again, lots of set of variability. I recently played with the no Nomads expansion, which adds additional kingdom cards, additional boards, additional special locations that uh, trigger additional actions for you. Really cool, fun game. Very, very simple. Very gateway-like. That's why it won the Spiel des Jahres winner and a game that I strongly recommend. My number five, Spiel des Jahres winner of all time, 
Kingdom Builder. And now we move on to my number four Spiel des Yards winner of all time, and that is Azul. Azul by Michael Kiesling, who I mentioned earlier with Tikal. He has won a few of these awards over the years, mostly with Wolfgang Kramer. I believe this is the first time that he won this coveted award by himself. And Azul is basically the prototypical Spiel des Jahres game because this is a beautiful gateway game. The production quality is amazing. It has such table presence and visual appeal. But also, mechanically speaking, it's a neat game. This is a abstract strategy game of sorts, but it includes a really cool Euro mechanism because you have these this tile drafting that takes place each turn. You have these different uh, discs or tiles that represent factories, and on top of them, you put the tiles from the game on top of them, the different color-coded uh, tiles, and players have to draft from one of these factory discs, and when they do, they have to grab all of the tiles of a particular shade or a particular color. And when they do, all of the other tiles on that factory disc are going to be placed into the center, which is another pool that players can draft from. And just manipulating this whole thing is a really neat process. Then after you draft these tiles, you got to place them on the side spaces of your player board. And it has five different rows on the side, and it has a row of one, a row of two, a row of three, a four, and five. And you need to be able to fill out all the spaces in that row before you can, at the end of your turn, slide over one of those tiles to the right to the grid, which is the main part of your board, which you're trying to fill out in order to score points. Really simple when you get to play this game, but at the same time, it feels very satisfying from a thoughtful or strategic perspective. And again, just watching the game, just seeing it laid out before you on the table is, again, very much satisfying. My number four Spiel des Jahres winner of all time, Azul. My number three Spiel des Jahres winner of all time is Carcassonne. Yes, Carcassonne. And again, this is one of the older Spiel des Jahres winners. This game is 21 years old at this point. But... It is still, it stands the test of time as far as I'm concerned. This game here, designed by uh, Klaus Jürgen Vrede, is the pioneer almost of the tile lane genre. There were other games that were doing tile lane or tile placement of some sorts, but this is basically the game that popularized the mechanism, and it's also the game that first innovated the idea of you kind of build the board as you go. Your um placing these different tiles and basically it's kind of like puzzle puzzle making because you need to make sure that whatever tile you lay when you lay adjacent to another existing tile that it continues the landscape that it does not interrupt the landscape or interfere with the current uh pattern of the artwork there and that's a tough decision to make throughout the course of the game also when you place one of these tiles down you have the option to place down one of these nice little wooden pieces referred to as meeples this is also the game that coined the term meeples and popularized that phrase which so many people use it as their Instagram handle nowadays. So obviously the term has become ingrained in the hobby and very much a part of the everyday board game vernacular. And basically you have that simple decision. Do I want to place a meeple down or do I not? And based on where you place the meeple, based on the type of um, feature you place it on, on the tile, will determine how it scores, when it scores, and how much it scores for you. Very simple at its core. Um, but at the end of the day, when you add lots of the expansions that they added afterward, it does add a little bit of meat and complexity to the game, which is the way I play. Unless I'm introducing this to a total noob or a total novice, I always play with one or two expansions. As a matter of fact, I play with almost all the meeples uh, from the expansions, but I may not necessarily include the different tiles from the expansions every time I play, but I definitely want to play with those meeples, which give you additional uh, options and choices to make when you place down your tiles. Really cool game, really easy to play. There's so many spin-offs nowadays, and that's another reason why I still kind of stay into this game, because I really enjoy the spin-offs to this game. I enjoy uh, the Gold Rush uh, spin-off. I enjoy the Hunters and Gatherers spin-off, and I also enjoy the uh, castle uh, iteration, which was actually made by Reiner Knizia, not Klaus Jürgen Brede. And I'm getting ready to play the city iteration soon, and I'm very much looking forward to that. So again, this game just between the expansions and the different spin-off content, it really keeps me into it. And again, this game has been able to kind of reinvent itself and recreate itself in ways that some older games have not been able to do so. My number three, Spiel des Jahres winner of all time, Carcassonne. And my number two, Spiel des Jahres winner of all time is... 
El Grande by Wolfgang Kramer. And again, we had Kramer earlier with Tikal. And this game here is basically the pioneer, the grandfather of the um, mechanism known as Area Majority, where players are basically placing different pieces that represent their presence in a region. And you are scoring by having more in that region than everybody else. Or maybe you have the secondary amount or tertiary amount, and you score fewer points, but you score nonetheless. And basically, the board consists of a map of Spain and... It's the, divided into a bunch of different regions, and this is kind of like 17th or 18th century Spain. And players are controlling one particular region with their grande, which represents that that's their starting space and that they're going to score additional points every time they maintain the majority there. But you're basically participating in a draft of different action cards that allow you to do different things. First of all, the action cards tell you how many meeples or cubes you're allowed to place on different regions uh, for your turn, but they also allow you some additional actions that might be helpful to you, that might allow you to redistribute and move around and relocate some of your already existing caballeros on the board, or they might grant you access or powers that are detrimental and hurtful to the other players around the table, right? Maybe you can remove some of their cubes from the board or maybe manipulate them and relocate them to their disadvantage. And basically, before you participate in this card draft for your actions, you're actually actually participating in an auction for turn order first and it's a really cool and neat auction um just everything from the game from the auction bidding for turn order which is a mechanism i always appreciate in games to the card drafting for the different actions and then manipulating the placement of those caballeros because you cannot just place them anywhere you want instead you have to have this a king piece. It's a, a big giant pawn that represents the king of Spain. And throughout the game, players are going to be moving around from region to region. But you could only place your caballeros on regions that are adjacent to the region in which the king finds himself. And you can never place it on the king. That's always a no-no. There is no exception to that rule. So there's some ways to bend and tweak the rule of placement as far as adjacency to the king, but you can never place it within the king. You also have this castillo, this uh, set-apart uh, area Area that is basically a tower where you can, throughout the course of the game, secretly dump, dump in a little bit of your um, caballeros, your meeples in there. And basically, it's a, a memory game. Players have to kind of remember who put meeples into that castillo and how many. And at the end of each scoring round, you will score for having the majority there as well. And then afterward, you can grab those meeples or those caballeros and you can place them in one particular region on the map. Really cool. I've been playing with some of the expansions, the... Um, uh, Grandissimo expansion, and there is the Inquisition expansion, I believe it's called. And these expansions, they add some really cool, neat additions to the game. They add the New World. You have the Americas, you have Africa, and they add France even as different locations in which players can vie for control. And it adds an additional uh, gold and uh, wear resource that players can try to have uh, majorities in those as well in order to score additional points this game is really really cool and i really wish that the people that i played with that i game with liked it more because this is by far out of all the games in my collection the game that has the biggest disparity between how much i enjoy it and how much the people i game with enjoy there are a few people that indulge me or are willing to play with me from time to time but nobody absolutely adores this game the way i do my number two Spiel des Jahres winner of all time, El Grande. And now we move on to my number one Spiel des Jahres winner of all time, and that is Dominion. And here I have the Adventure Expansion, or standalone big box expansion. And this game here, Dominion, is a classic in the hobby at this point. It is the grandfather of the deck building genre, which is so ubiquitous. It is so popular and so beloved by so many gamers nowadays. This game is designed by Donald X. Vaccarino, so this is the second game by Donald X. Vaccarino on this list. He also de designed uh, Kingdom Builder. And this game here, as I mentioned, is the grandfather of the deck building genre, and it is such a basic game it's a great gateway game especially the core box because it's pretty straightforward you play a couple of um, action cards on your turn trigger or actually you can only play one action card unless you play action cards that grant you more actions and you execute this action and afterwards you play down your treasure cards and you purchase other cards you can purchase more actions to add to your deck or you can purchase more treasure in order to buy cards that are valuable or you can purchase the victory point cards which are essentially 
the condition, the objective of the game is to get as many of these victory point cards as possible. But early on, you might want to be careful because these victory cards, for the most part, are duds in your deck, in your hand, and they don't do anything for you other than score you points at the end of the game. Now, with each um, expansion, a lot of cool little ideas and mechanisms are introduced, which is why this game has stayed so relevant over the years. Everywhere from the Intrigue expansion to the Seaside expansion to the Prosperity expansion to the most recent Renaissance expansion, all of these expansions are adding not only additional content, but additional mechanisms, introducing things that are new and innovative. And lots of the deck building games out there have borrowed from these different innovations from Dominion and have tried to do it, obviously, in their own way. But Dominion, again, is just such a fresh game. I do not like playing with attack cards. Attack cards are my absolute least favorite part of Dominion. Not so much because I mind attacking as a aspect of gameplay. I'm totally fine playing games that are attack heavy. The problem with Dominion is that the attack cards slow the game down so much. And one of my favorite things about Dominion is the fact that I play this game with people in about 25 to 30 minutes. And it just, it's such a crunchy experience for such a short time. The amount of pleasure and satisfaction I get to the amount of time that I invest in it, it's, an, it's a perfect ratio. And when you add those attack cards, sometimes it adds 15, 20, maybe even 30 minutes to a game. And at that point, I'm not liking it as much. But again, really cool, fun game. Uh, it's going to be a staple of my collection for years, decades to come. And it's a staple of the industry. My number one, Spiel des Jahres winner of all time, Dominion. And that's it as far as today's list is concerned. The top 10 Spiel des Jahres winners of all time. Please comment down below and tell me what your favorite Spiel des Jahres winner is. Also, comment down below and let me know which of these 10 games you think has absolutely no business being on a list like this. I'm interested in reading what you have to say. This is Harry saying take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have fun gaming.